If you don't calm down, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Lady, I got buddies who died face down in the muck so that you and I can enjoy this family restaurant. All right, I'm out of here. Hey, dude, don't go away, man. Come on, this affects all of us, man. Our basic freedoms. I'm staying. I'm finishing my coffee. Enjoying my coffee. Welcome to Truman's Town Hall with your host, Matt Truman. Hello, hello, this is Matt Truman. Thank you for downloading this episode. Thank you for sharing with a friend. And I appreciate everyone downloading this episode. Wow, this podcast has grown over the past month. It has, and I appreciate everyone downloading, listening, sharing, subscribing. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you get a podcast, we're there. We're even over on Amazon podcast. So just say Alexa, play Truman's Town Hall podcast and boom, it'll play an episode for you. So with that, I want to say thank you folks, Russia and Ukraine. Whoa, they're at war. And as I have been talking about since last November 2021, Russia would not invade until after the Olympics. And we were right here on Truman's Town Hall. We were right, folks. I I just, it's history. I'm a student of history. I follow this stuff. I find it interesting at the same time, heartbreaking to watch a lot of the things that I've been watching. Uh, And not only the death of, and destruction, which is the, the main point of all this. Uh, you know, who wants, I don't want war, I want peace. And I want folks who are going to be caught into the middle of all this, which we may all be caught in the middle of all of this soon enough. But I want peace. I want peace for you, for me, for Ukraine, for Russia, you know, China, Taiwan. I want peace for all of us. I'd love to have peace throughout the world and Doggone it, I just wish we all could get along. And I think for the most part, people do get along. You got these schmoes out here like Putin and Biden and all these war hawks, these talking heads all over the TV networks talking, we need war. We got to respond. We got to provide these Ukrainians with all these missiles and then the, you know, Look, there's a 40-mile convoy. Why don't we just light them up with A-10s and, you know, be done? Folks, there are repercussions to all of this stuff. We'll talk about that. And at the end of this podcast, I'm going to play a clip from my hometown, Huber Heights, that I find very interesting. Huber Heights was attempting to annex a portion of Miami County, which is next to Montgomery County, if you're not from around there. And they were trying to take a portion of that land, have it developed with their prize developer there in Heber Heights. And it did not go the way they wanted it to. So I think Mayor Gore was a little upset. Has he had donations from that developer? Dun, dun, dun. Later in this program, folks, we'll talk about that a little bit. And we'll play that little clip because there is no video. I can't post it because for some reason the video was down. They just upgraded it. They spent like 20 grand upgrading this video system and uh, there's no video. Oh, they took a a play from the Jeffrey Epstein playbook. (laughs) Well, if there's no video, well, they did get sound. So at least there's that. Look, things happen. I'm just teasing. Things happen. Video doesn't always work. I get it. I I deal with technology, and I'm not the best person when it comes to technology, and I know there are issues. I've had to troubleshoot putting this podcast out several times. Anywho, we'll talk about that Huber Heights stuff at the end of this podcast because we've got a lot to go through. I'm going to play a lot of clips. 
We're going to play some of the talking heads. We're going to play some of the alternative stuff that's out there. We're going to play some news clips. You know, this may get long, and I hope you stay with me. Uh, we're going to have some analysis to all of this. What am I thinking? What, 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 you know, just a guy who predicted it wasn't going to happen until after the Olympics. You know, I was saying this before they were uh, putting on generals and stuff saying it, right? We played General Jack King, who said the very same thing, but I said it before Jack King. I said it before a lot of people were saying it. Anyway, I study this stuff, and uh, it's uh, it's heartbreaking to see. Families are being ripped apart. People are being killed. This is not... This is not something I wanted to see happen. But with all the politics throughout the world, and they play a lot of politics throughout the world, it happened. Is it entirely Russia's fault? Well, it is that they invaded, sure. But what happens when you have your border being surrounded by NATO? What happens? I'll tell you what happens. You get invaded. That's what happens. And you go to the most logical place to invade, which was the Ukraine. Let's play this clip, folks. This is uh, Ted Cruz talking. Ted Cruz is a senator from Texas. It's important that we remember what America's interest is in Ukraine. You know, sometimes there are Republicans who talk about Ukraine and they talk about the need to defend democracy, to defend mm -hmm. global norms. Uh, frankly, I think that's all gobbledygook. The objective of U.S. foreign policy, the job of the military, is to defend American national security. And the reason we have an acute interest in what Putin is doing is because Putin has told us his objective, which is to reassemble the old Soviet Union. When we were in the Cold War with two superpowers, America and the Soviet Union, it was profoundly dangerous for America. Americans were in greater jeopardy when the Soviet Union was a strong enemy. Putin is trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. Actually, the speech he gave a week ago, he said he wanted to rebuild the Russian Empire of 1922. Yes. It is in our interest to keep our enemies weak. We don't want a stronger Vladimir Putin with desires to conquer Europe and conquer the world. That's why we have a strong interest in preventing him from getting stronger because it's more dangerous for us. You know, the second point you made, respectfully, I, I, I don't think it's right that this was inevitable. I think this was preventable. It's the, it's the most frustrating aspect about it, is I think Joe Biden made specific mistakes that caused this invasion. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a classified briefing with all 100 senators. And one of the Democratic senators stood up and asked the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, said, why did Putin not invade Ukraine in 2017? or in 2018, or 2019, or 2020. And i got to admit, Harris, I and several other senators began laughing, because the answer is obvious, which is that Putin only respects strength. And he believed President Trump was strong. He didn't want to risk the consequences. And critically, Trump had signed into law the sanctions that I authored, shutting down Nord Stream 2, which means if Putin invaded Ukraine, he risks jeopardizing the pipelines that go through Ukraine. And without those pipelines, Putin can't get his gas to Europe. It's why Nord Stream 2 was so important. And when mm -hmm. Biden came in, he just surrendered Nord Stream 2 to Putin. He waived the sanctions formally. And, and he did so because this president, this administration believes when you're facing an enemy, you should show weakness. You should show appeasement. They think that's how you stop aggression. That's what they did with the Taliban. That's what they did with Russia. That's what they're doing with China. That's what they're doing with Iran, trying to give Iran hundreds of billions of dollars, which will only allow the Ayatollah to Senator, get a nuclear weapon. And appeasement doesn't work. It's more dangerous. Your description of why Ukraine is important to Americans, to why we are being told to sacrifice with the gas prices now pushed higher than they were already with the inflationary disaster that we were having before the end of 2021. That explanation was missing from the president's address, yeah. quite frankly, last night. And, and people who were listening to put those puzzle pieces together uh, didn't get that. You've done some of that today, and it's tremendously helpful. And I, I know that there's some politics mixed in, too, but you have given a primer on what we are about 
about and what our foreign policy is about with regard to that. Great. I hope people are paying attention. Uh, Senator Cruz, thank you very much for your time. Senator Ted Cruz on Fox News. Folks, I just want to read a few things to you. So if you're looking to get good information and you're not in Ukraine or Russia, um, the television news networks probably aren't the best for information other than to see what they're talking about. And I've been flipping CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, uh, the Patriot Channel on S, uh, XM Radio, uh, there's one called Progressive, you know, NPR. And then I've been watching, uh, like we played before, DW News, French television. Uh, we we're getting some reports from Ukraine. I also reviewed um, some Oliver Stone documentaries that are over on Amazon and Showtime. On Showtime, there's Oliver Stone interviews through four episodes, Vladimir Putin. I encourage everyone to go watch that. Don't just listen. Oh, he's a madman. He's changing. He's this. He's that. Look, I'm not sticking up for Putin. But there are some things about Putin that I think you would get a better grasp at and understand that there is some rhetoric. There is some propaganda being spilled out there. Okay. Again, not speak, uh, sticking up for Putin or thinking he's a good guy or any of this. No. I do believe, and I've said it in previous podcasts, he is trying to bring back the Soviet Union. He wants to leave a legacy behind. He's in his 70s. He seems like a healthy man to me. I don't know the guy's medical history. But everywhere you look, everybody knows his medical history. Or they try to assume so. Oh, Lord, Putin doesn't look right. I think he's crazy. He's messed up in the head. Something's going on. Well, you know where that comes from. It comes from his predecessor who drunk himself to death. And that's why he stepped down. So in uh, 91, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there's a fellow by the name of Boris Yeltsin that took office as president. Vladimir Putin had worked his way up through the KB, KGB into the political system. Boris Yeltsin appointed Vladimir Putin to be his successor. Yeltsin was a drinker. That dude drank a lot, and he burnt his brain up doing this. And you got to do a lot of drinking to do that. So anyway, Putin comes in, and he was president from 2000 until about 2009 or 2008 and then Dmitry Medvedev came in in 2008 to 2012 and then miraculously cuz you're only supposed to serve two terms in Russia but they get around all this then Putin comes back in 2012 and he is your president in Russia if you live there to this day it's not exactly a democracy, folks, but they call it a federal democracy. They call Ukraine a federal democracy, and it's not really a democracy. Zelensky, the propped-up hero of the West, is not really a propped-up hero. Is he showing some pretty, um, is he showing toughness? Dang straight he is. Yes, that dude Hey, when you got the big Russian army coming after you, say, no, I'm going to stay here and fight. That's pretty tough. Got to hand it to him. But Zelensky's a puppet. Zelensky is a puppet to the West. That's what Putin knows. Putin doesn't want the West to encroach on his country. For instance, Russia spends about $60 billion dollars on defense, the United States spends six hundred billion dollars on defense. That's rough, rough estimate, right? We, and I say we in quotes here, we would crush Russia militarily, but they have nukes. We have nukes. We would destroy each other with our nuclear weapons. We're talking goodbye, L.A. 
goodbye half of the coast of California, right? Maybe up into Washington State. Goodbye New York and part of the uh, eastern seaboard. Maybe some bases in between. Maybe in Texas. Maybe in Ohio, right? Patterson, right? These are all different. These have all been discussed about targets. So we don't want to get to a nuclear war. But folks, folks, the rhetoric I'm hearing from a lot of senators and representatives in this country and even through the Biden administration, we're getting close. What if Putin moves in to Poland? Article 5. I'm sure you guys have been listening. You've heard about Article 5. What happens then? We get involved. They attack a NATO country. We get involved. We're part of it, right? And then our sons and daughters end up being drafted because we're going to need a lot of people. Oh, the draft won't happen, Matt. Nuclear war won't happen, Matt. Yeah. And I also heard, oh, Russia is not going to invade Ukraine, Matt. Not saying this, all this stuff's going to happen. I'm just saying it might. Like Chris Rock said, you may not be a hoe, but you wearing a hose uniform. I don't know. You have to <laughs> watch some Chris Rock. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's play some more clips, shall we? We got to play some clips. So as a student of history, I'm going to play this video by Greg Reese. The first casualty of war is the truth. The first casualty of war is the truth. And if the American people knew the truth about U.S. interference in Ukraine, they might not be so eager to start World War III. During World War II, Western Ukraine sided with the Nazis. After the war, the CIA helped Ukrainian Nazis evade the Nuremberg trials and began operating with them within the Ukraine. After decades of CIA infiltration, the Ukrainian People's Movement emerged in 1989 and gave birth to extremist groups Svoboda, Trident, and Right Sector. Neo-Nazi groups pushing for the ethnic cleansing of Ukraine. Extremist groups cultivated by the CIA supported by the U.S. State Department and used by the IMF to bring Ukraine to heal. When Yanukovych beat NATO-backed Yushchenko in the 2010 elections, his government was being pressured into signing an EU association agreement by the International Monetary Fund in their typical conquer-by-debt offer that would financially ruin the Ukraine and place them at the mercy of the World Bank. Yanukovych declined their offer. And in today's corrupt world, you're not allowed to say no to the IMF. Funded by Western NGOs associated with George Soros and the CIA, a highly organized color revolution was immediately deployed against Yanukovych. Organizations such as the National Endowment for Democracy trained activist journalists to utilize Facebook along with three brand new television networks created within weeks to recruit people for the protests. This Western-run media campaign was a huge success. The turnout was massive. The CIA has been orchestrating revolutions their entire career, and the first step to their simple formula is to convince people to take to the streets in peaceful protest. They then use agitators to goad the police into violence and state-run media to ignite the crowd with emotionally charged reports of sacred victims. On November 30th, 2013, the Ukrainian chief of staff, associated closely with the U.S. State Department, ordered the streets to be cleared of protesters for the erection of the annual Christmas tree. When the police arrived, they were met by a highly aggressive and well-organized faction of Ukraine's right sector who provoked the police into a violent reaction against peaceful protesters, which is all the Western intelligence media reported on. Predictably, this resulted in more unrest and violence, which was further fueled by U.S. Senator John McCain's support of the protests. Leaked phone calls reveal that the U.S. State Department was orchestrating this coup d'etat from within the U.S. Embassy with support from Vice President Joe Biden. On February 20th, unidentified snipers firing from government buildings occupied by the protesters began firing into the crowd, killing people on all sides. Yanukovych's home and offices were taken by armed mobs, 
and a new government was put into place with a neo-Nazi element that went on to accept the IMF's spurious loan offer and began murdering the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine in Donbass. As a result of this Western-created quagmire, 96% of the people in Crimea voted in favor of joining Russia. And while the nation celebrated, Western media reported that they were invaded by Russia. Their proof? A Russian military presence which has existed there since 1804. Supporting a criminal war against Russia does not make you a patriot. It makes you a useful idiot of the globalist banking cartel. The very same entities waging war on all of humanity with vaccine passports and experimental jabs. A righteous patriot would call out his government for war crimes. And through fraud and deceit, the United States government has been the world's biggest purveyor of war crimes for decades. All in the name of spreading McDonald's, genetically modified foods, and sexual perversions worldwide. Reporting for InfoWars, this is Greg Reese. Well, that's one perspective. <laughs> anyway, that was Greg Reese, a uh, little history. Oh, there's a lot to dive into on the history. You can't just believe what is being pumped out at us. But uh, let, let, let's give another perspective on this situation. I think it's important that we hear more about what's happening around the world, and we listen to some news reports and see what, you know, maybe what Western media is saying, not the alternative Western media that we just played. No. We'll play some other stuff. Here it goes. I thought maybe we would change the mood up a little bit and talk about the coming apocalypse. Talk about what Alexander Dugan believes is an apocalypse to give you an understanding of this situation and the situation in Ukraine and our oil situation everything else I think I have connected in my mind now what I feel was missing in this story I think the Ukraine story is going to make sense to you in just a few minutes let me let me replay a phone call that came in uh, about a half an hour ago. I was calling because um, from your documentaries and your interviews on what you, the expose that you did on Ukraine and the Bidens mm -hmm. and the interviews you've had with Teitelbaum, the discussions that you've had about Dugan. Yes. Um, what I am seeing is making the connections from what you have taught and then the encouragement that you have given your audience to go out and do their own homework. I have gone out and read Duke, and I've read Title Bomb's work. That's which are great, by the way. Yeah. And your work, your latest book, I'm about halfway through with that. Mm -hmm. But listening, listening to you, you've told us these things. Um, Putin, in my opinion, putting all the pieces together, his main goal, because it's a spiritual goal for him that'll keep him motivated, is he is fighting the globalist Great Reset. Yes. And Yes. <laughs> yes. And yes. what is the what is the United States and the other side fighting? Oh, we are fighting against the Great Reset. Yeah, no, 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 no. In this war, he's fighting the Great Reset because it's a globalist movement. And the globalists are fighting the um, the nationalist socialist uh, idea, the idea that that Russia is all important or that China is all important. It's the globe against the nationalists. That's what really is being, that's not what we're fighting. That's not what the average person anywhere in the world is fighting, but that's what our leadership all over the globe is fighting for. Russia to put Russia back on top. China to make sure they're on top and the West to make sure we all come together in a nice globalist one unit package that will all march to the sound of the same drum. You're right. Good job. Let's go back to that that uh, conversation that we just had on the phone. Because obviously we are not fans of the Great Reset, for example. We are not fans not of the Great, fans Great, Reset. Great Reset. And yes. the caller said that Russia is fighting against the Great Reset. 
the globalist great reset is that correct really the way she said it yes and then you said she was right mm-hmm. so are you i because i don't feel like okay. i'm fighting on the same side as vladimir no, Putin on this one you're not okay you're not Th- this is i need to express and i've been trying to express this in many ways you've got to stop looking at the world you used to live in the world you think you live in right now that world is over it's gone okay you, the reason why we can't make ground is because people won't change. There's been a paradigm shift. And until you cross over and realize, oh, wait a minute, it's a different game being played. You're going to lose. You're destined to lose. Okay? So here's what's happening. There are two realities. There's the one that most of us believe we're in right now, Republicans versus Democrats or, you know, the the Marxist against the constitutionalist. We believe that we live in a country that is free, that our republic represents us um, and that we have rights. And the president of the United States actually represents the people of the United States. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't live in that world anymore. Here's the real world. This is the world of the elites. It is national socialism, fascism. That's China and Russia, okay? They will control their economies. They will tell industry exactly what to do in Russia and in China. You don't agree, they kill you, okay? That is a system that they've had for a long time, and they're fighting for that, a nationalist system. Russia is important. China is not going to join any global community and say, China is just another one of many nations. They're not going to do it. Neither will Putin. Okay? But that's what's happening to the West. Through the Great Reset, the Western leadership, they're not listening... Let me ask you this. How is it the United States, the president of the United States, is is still buying Russian and Iranian oil today and telling us that there's nothing he can do about the price of oil and how it's going through, We how it's going up? We all know he can. Just turn the spigot back on. Right. We all know He's that. just saying feel the pain. Correct. And the American people are going to have to, you know, they're going to sacrifice for their values. Wait a minute. I don't see any of you guys sacrificing. What do you mean? We're going to have to sacrifice and there's nothing you can do. There's lots of things you can do because he's not the president of the United States. He's one president in the Great Reset. America's not special. You notice that we're not really leading the charge. It's France. It's England. It's Poland. We're in the mix. But it's a coalition. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen, with every war, we've put together an international coalition. Uh Uh-huh. And we've got some sanctions. Uh Uh-huh. Have you ever seen sanctions work? Not not (laughs) to the extent. I mean, they they might have some effect. Yeah, they have some effect. They had an effect on Iran. But, I mean, only really hard ones and minimal effects usually. Right. And why is it minimal? Because Iran can sell to somebody else. Right. They'll sell to France. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do the sanctions really mean? Because you can't get everybody on the same page. Right. Now, let me talk about sanctions, the same kind of sanctions. When we went to war with with Germany, you couldn't do business with a, a business in the Reich. So what did they do? IBM was there at Auschwitz. It's the IBM machines that made the Germans so efficient. Well, those machines, they were it was early punch cards. They had to be re, they had to be fixed every 2 weeks. Well, we're, IBM's not going to do business. IBM did business. They just did it in their European offices. So, IBM America, oh no, no no, we're not doing it. IBM Europe was doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay? You can't when sanctions, you can't get all the countries together. And then you can't get private industry because you can't tell private industry exactly what to do. And they'll find a loophole if they're making money. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, look at the sanctions that are happening right now. The federal government and all governments around the world 
They're not the ones that control SWIFT. That's a international banking that belongs to the banking sector. When you look at what's happening with the oil in Russia, Russia is not able to fill any tankers. Okay, they, They've got the port. They can get people, they can get oil into the tanker, but they can't sell it to anybody. They're even cutting the price. They're even saying, we'll pay for the shipping. Why won't anybody do it? They won't do it for a couple of reasons. One, the insurance companies will not insure those companies or those countries that are buying that oil. They say, no, you're on your own. If something happens to it, you pay for all of it. The other thing is the banks have told those countries sanctions can go on you, private, not, not no, this is not governments, this is private bank saying, you know, I don't know if that's going to go well for you because then we have to question you and maybe you should receive sanctions. That's like IBM saying, hey, you're killing all the Jews. We're pulling all of our machines out. They didn't do that. Businesses never do that. Why is it happening this time? I truly believe this is the only thing that has made sense to me yet on trying to, to figure this whole Ukrainian thing out. Opportunities at online. What did Joe Biden do when he first got into office? He made it so Europe could have this pipeline. Whew. Okay, they're going to get oil. Then when he started flexing his muscles, what did he do? He said... Well, you know, this is five weeks ago. I mean, we don't know if he, I mean, if he goes in and tries to take Ukraine, but if it's just a small incursion, then maybe, maybe then we'll have to discuss it. Minor incursion. Minor incursion. That means probably those two territories that he first said he was going to go in and get. Okay, a minor incursion. Then maybe, I don't know what we'll do. Well, if I'm Putin, I look at my advisors when I hear that and go, did he just tell us we could take half of Ukraine and it would be kind of cool? Let's go. So our president has been enabling, enabling, enabling the whole world. Why didn't they just say, lie about it? Why didn't you just say Ukraine's not going to get into NATO? It's not even on. It's it's we're not doing that. Why didn't you just say that? Could have all been avoided, right? We didn't take easy steps, and we enabled him every step of the way. I'm not saying we plotted this or it was a plan to have him, but it is a crisis now, a major crisis that you don't want to go to waste. So now he's in. I've never seen sanctions like this ever before. Total and complete Except for that little leaky oil problem. It does seem, though, that these are the harshest sanctions I've ever, ever put seen on a country. I've ever seen. And, and it's because of the private businesses being in step with the global governments. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before. They can tell you, but there's always works or workarounds because they're global companies. Okay? So now it's completely shut off. If this works, why will these sanctions be the first sanctions to work? Because both sides are, are participating in unison, right? They're working Public and private, private partnerships. Mm -hmm. Global. Not America, not led by Biden, but led by the world, led by the entire West. We didn't put this together. It was a cooperative. See what we can accomplish if we all just work as one. One, imagine what we could do. Now, gosh, because of this, oil has just shot through the roof. And I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's good and bad. It stops inflation because nobody can afford anything or go anywhere because they can't afford oil. And oil helps us with all kinds of things from synthetics to medicine to fertilizer and now everything it's a crisis it's a crisis oil being at 150 60 200 dollars a barrel is a crisis and it has caused food shortages do you remember what happened when there was a wheat shortage in egypt arab 
spring. So we all have to work together again. We are watching the formation. What Ukraine is, is 15 days to flatten the curve. That's what Ukraine is. COVID was real. How it got out, I don't know. Not important, but it was real. It's not a conspiracy. It was real. What did they do? Took advantage. They took advantage. And all of us cheered it on. We were like, yeah, that's right. We should stay in our house. for, But we let the government do all of these things. We let them, because it was an emergency, yeah, you, you should do those things. You should have those powers. And you're never going to get them back. Ukraine is 15 days to flatten a curve. What happens on the other side, I don't think we ever go back. And they make the case, only the Great Reset, only this public-private global partnership is, is going to work from here on out. Look at what we've accomplished without any bullets. So you're worried about how this power is used in the future. Maybe it it's is, not just an invading nation of a big me, nation inviting a small take, nation, as Kamala would explain it. Let me take just one minute okay. and then just talk to you about Switzerland, which I find amazing. The president pointed out is a speech yesterday uh, in 60 seconds. Okay, so did you know that Switzerland was like, we're not going to take what? We're going to stop we're neutral. Putin? No, we're neutral. You know what we do. We take gold and money from anybody. It's our and thing. it's all anonymous. It's why Swiss bank accounts are different than any other bank account. It's completely private. We don't ask any questions. Just put it here. Okay? That's the Swiss bank account that everybody knows. So the world came to, the banks came to, Swiss, to Switzerland and said, hey, guys, you got to cut off all of the funding and close those accounts with all of the oligarchs and everything in Russia. And they're like, you realize you're in Switzerland. That's kind of what we do. We, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. Otherwise, we're not a Swiss bank account. The next day, you're starting to see stories about how Switzerland is holding all of the pilfered gold from Venezuela and from the Philippines We've known they're, they have dirty gold and dirty money. But where do you think the Nazi money went? Yes, we know that. But that was released after they said, no, 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 we can't help out. And what did they do after that release? Oh, you know what? We, I'm sorry, we had hot chocolate and the Swiss Miss on our mind. We're going to help. That's because the business sector came down on Switzerland and said, you're going to play by our rules. The one thing I learned about TARP, I know a guy who worked for Citi, Citibank, and he was their um, CFO. And he was there the night that the crash was happening. It was a Sunday night. And he said, we didn't need the bailout. We were fine. And the government said to him and all those in the room, you are all taking this, all of you, whether you like it or not, no one is leaving this room until all of your signatures are on this paper. You had no choice. That's fascism. That's what's happening here. And we're going to wake up after this is all said and done. We'll be like, oh, this was great. And then we'll realize oh, no, just like Canada, they enacted the Great Reset, and the left thinks that's wonderful, uh, you know, just to get rid of these very violent terrorist truckers. That, that's, that's what the Great Reset is, that. This is a positive attribute of the Great Reset. But know that it is the Great Reset. This isn't the usual system. This is not, this is something brand new that they are doing to Putin. Now let's see if it works. My guess is it will and we'll all celebrate. Oh, I'm sorry.
Was, was that not the Western media you were expecting? Glenn Beck from the Glenn Beck program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Great Reset Agenda 2030. Look it up. Duck, duck, go it. It's alive and well. We've talked about that on this podcast. So I won't bore you with any more details. Let's let's actually listen to what uh, many media sources are saying out there, Western media sources, about how things are in Ukraine and Russia at the moment. Fox News alert. Four explosions have just rocked Ukraine's capital. Let's bring in foreign correspondent Trey Yingst live in Kiev. Trey. Jesse, good evening. We're trying to learn more about these explosions in the capital of Ukraine. We heard large blasts followed by air raid sirens, and then just a few minutes ago, more air raid sirens. An indication the city is under attack by Russian forces, something similar we've seen over the past several days as cruise missiles slammed into both military and residential targets. There is a big concern here that as that large convoy, nearly 40 miles long of Russian troops, artillery units, and tanks is stalled outside of Kiev that President Putin of Moscow could order, order more significant strikes on not only military but also civilian infrastructure here as to bring the city to its knees as he pushes forward with a ground campaign. But again tonight, what we can report, four large explosions in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev along with air raid sirens. Jesse? Trey, thank you so much for that report. Former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant General Douglas Liu. General Liu, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, reports have come in that the Ukrainian city of Kherson has now been occupied by Russian troops, potentially making it the first city to fall. How does this change the war in Ukraine? Well, my first thought is that in warfare, the first report is often wrong. So we should take these initial reports for um, for as simply that, just first reports. These things can swing very, uh, very uh, quickly, even uh, day to day. Um, I think it is significant, though, if the reports are correct, that Kherson uh, may now be under control of Russian forces. Why is that? Because the, these are Russian forces that came out of the Crimea Peninsula in the south, uh, turned west and encountered Kherson. Kherson's about 300,000 uh, people strong. And, and I think it will give us a model, if it is under Russian control, it will give us a model for what that Russian control, Russian administration, will look like. And if anything, I think that Kherson will become a rallying cry for Ukrainians, like the mayor that you just interviewed. And four Russian fighter jets appear to have violated Swedish airspace. What can Sweden and other Scandinavian countries do to keep Russian planes out? Well, look, violation of national airspace has been going on for some time, especially in the Baltic Sea region and the Black Sea region. Um, Sweden is perfectly capable of defending its airspace, and I'm sure that Swedish fighters were, um, were alerted uh, and uh, sent to the scene of the, of the incursion. Typically what happens is that these incursions are not very deep, not very long in duration, and they're turned away quite quickly. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed little optimism for talks between Ukraine and Russia today. Uh, why do you think the dismal outlook? Well, it appears that President Putin has selected a course of action that he's going to stick with. Uh, I would like to say that Putin will, before he backs down and moves to diplomacy, he will double down on the military effort. So I think that there's not a bright light now. There doesn't seem to be much of an opening now for diplomacy. But we should always keep that as an option because wars typically end not by complete control of one side over the other, but by some sort of diplomatic deal. It's just that the path of that diplomacy right now in these early days isn't very clear. As countries like Poland open their borders to tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees, are you concerned at all about the Russians exploiting the chaotic flow of refugees out of Ukraine or the weapons being sent into Ukraine to their advantage? So not yet. So the Russian, uh, the Russian forces are fixated and largely consumed by the fight in the east. That's hundreds of miles from the Polish border. So, so far, the refugees, which numbers appear now to be up close to a, a million, uh, are fleeing from uh, the center of the country, from Kiev and so forth, westward, uh, on, on foot, 
uh, by road uh, into Poland and other NATO countries. That road so far appears to be jammed, but open. And as you mentioned, uh, these are the same routes which in reverse flow will uh, will supply the Ukrainian um, resistance and the Ukrainian army. So this is a two-way flow uh, across those borders between Western Ukraine and NATO. And the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations today accused Russia of using cluster and vacuum bombs, the use of both are banned under the Geneva Convention. Is there anything that the international community can do to stop Russians from using these banned weapons? Well, there's not much we could do to stop it. I mean, if they're going to violate the international ban on these outlawed systems, then Russia's going to violate them. Uh, eventually, we can, might someday hold them to account. But these are these are... These are really brutal weapon systems. They're indiscriminate. They tend to cause a lot of civilian casualties. Uh, and that's, of course, why they were banned. Mr. Lute, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your insight. Next up, CBS News. Support for Ukraine and its president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is pouring in from all over Europe. CBS News contributor Simon Bates shows us how Russia's invasion of the country has united the continent in this week's London Calling. And a reminder, Simon's opinions are his own and not necessarily reflective of CBS News. Mr. Vladimir Zelensky, that very brave president of the Ukraine, has been an inspiration to his countrymen and women. But he's also inspired many of us in Europe into uniting as never before. Even just in sport, the results have been impressive. In barely a few days, Russia's been kicked out of the Soccer World Cup. The Champions League soccer final has been taken away from St. Petersburg. In Formula One motor racing, this year's Russian Grand Prix has been cancelled. Even rugby's world governing body has banned all Russian teams. And the European Parliament, in an emotional display of solidarity, stood and applauded President Zelensky as he spoke to them via a video link. So, if one of Mr. Putin's motivations was to divide the countries of Europe, the result from this invasion has been the exact opposite. And not just in our total commitment to Ukraine. Here in Britain, questions that have been rumbling for years are coming to the surface. Questions about the level of Russian interference over our daily lives. Cash donations by Russian interests to our political parties are a concern. Russian hit squads sent here to murder exiled opponents of President Putin are an outrage. But then, on each occasion, what did Europe do? Well, we huffed and puffed, but not much else. That's the lesson that Mr. Putin took when planning this invasion. He gambled that in the end Europe would be split and ineffective. But he looks like he got it utterly wrong. His war on Ukraine has brought so many of us in Europe together, frankly, we never realized we had so much in common. That's London Calling for today. This is Simon Bates for CBS News in Devon. We will fight on the beaches. We will fight on the landing grounds. All right, that was my best Winston Churchill. <laughs> all right, up next, a long clip, but a clip I think we all should listen to. Fox and Friends, Dan Crenshaw, let's roll it. But yesterday the White House said there would be, you know, the United States would not take part in any no-fly zone because that could bring us into an actual shoot war. Let's bring in Texas Congressman Dan Crenshaw, member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and a former Navy SEAL. Dan, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so it's, it, it's daunting. Uh, there's a 40-mile column of tanks and armored vehicles leading toward Kiev or Kiev. Uh, it's just a matter of time before they circle the city and then they will slowly try to strangle it. Um, the one bit of good news is apparently there's something like uh, 70 Ukrainian pilots in Poland at this hour picking up 70 donated fighter jets from European countries, including older Russian-made planes, like 28 from Poland, 12 from Slovakia, and 30 from Bulgaria. So if the Ukrainian Air Force is going to have a fighting chance, this is going to help them. Yeah, it certainly is. I'm glad to see a lot of uh, EU members stepping up. Uh, I still think they can do more, of course. I mean, you've got Russia right on your doorstep. Yeah. And th this is a fight for your life. Um, you know, I think a lot of people denied that right up until the moment it happened. But it is clearly the, clearly the case now. Um, 
you know, the EU has, has, has agreed to look at um, uh, Ukrainians' EU membership. That could be significant. That does require some kind of assistance uh, to them. Uh, so I think, I think Russia, I think Putin in particular, has clearly miscalculated. This is a bigger fight than they anticipated. They've lost thousands of troops. Um, if the estimates are even close to true, that's more than we ever lost in Afghanistan. And uh, we, need, we need to continue to make this as painful as possible for them with, uh, with, with the kind of lethal aid that we're talking about and the economic pain that we're inflicting on them. Yeah. Congressman, there was a special session of the U.N. General Assembly, and the Ukrainian ambassador stood up and read text messages. These are texts from a soldier, the mother of that soldier, he's Russian, the mother of that soldier thought that her son was training in Crimea. Turns out mm -hmm. he is on the front lines in Ukraine, and these are the text messages between the two of them just before he was killed. I would like to read from the screenshot of the smartphone, of a smartphone, uh, of a killed Russian soldier. Why has it been so long since you responded? Are you really in, during, in training exercises? Asks the mother of the killed the soldier. Moments before he was killed. Mama, Mama, I'm in Ukraine. There is a real war raging here. I'm afraid. We are bombing all of the cities together, even, even targeting civilians. We were told that they would welcome us. And they are falling under our armored vehicles, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascists. Mama, Mama this is so hard. In several moments he was killed. And this was several moments before he was killed. Congressman, what I gather from that, uh, they thought that we would be welcome into their country, and that's not the case. So is it Putin's regime that's telling these soldiers, they're going to welcome you, go fight for our country. They want you there. And then also targeting civilians. You can tell the soldier didn't realize what he was getting into. And, we, and we've heard various accounts like that. This goes to show the depth of the deception that Putin has incurred, not just on the rest of the world, but on his own people. Uh, you're seeing uprisings in Russia against this war. I think regular, regular Russian civilians are, are, are seeing this for what it is. And uh, Putin, Putin has lost his way quite a bit here. Uh, and he's losing domestic support. And this is what we need to capitalize on. He doesn't really care if he loses international support. This is not something Putin cares about. But he certainly cares about domestic support and whether his propaganda is actually working. Um, and we, we need to continue to pull this thread. We need to continue to pull this thread, incur the costs on Putin, and, and, and turn the Russian people against him. Congressman, everyone uh, respects the valor that the, the Ukrainians are fighting with, but the word is they only have about a week or two left of Stinger missiles, of, uh, of Javelin missiles. They need it. And right now we can't get everything through the air. It's got to be on the ground, most of which is going to come through Poland. But guess who knows that? The Russians know that. And they're already sending choppers there. So it's going to be very dangerous delivering food, water, and guns and ammunition and lethal aid. Now, the Washington Post reporting this three minutes ago, that Kharkiv remains under, control, under Ukrainian control, but is thoroughly surrounded and they are bracing for an all-out assault we just told you about the caravan that goes uh, uh, 40 miles deep they look like they're gonna do the same thing what do you think the people of Kharkiv should be braced for judging by the Russians tactics in the past well uh, uh, urban warfare is, is going to be terrible um, the, the Russians don't seem to have um, and any kind of restraint on what kind of tactics they're willing to use. They've done this in the past. I mean, the only, the only good news here is that Russian soldiers are having second thoughts. I would also say that they're, they're not good at fighting at night. This is something we've learned by watching them over the last week or so. Um, and uh, civilians can take advantage of that. But guerrilla warfare is also very scary for the people, um, for, for the Russian soldiers as well. Uh, Ukrainian people can, can take solace in that. But again, th this, this is why I say EU has to step up. 
the, the United, the, the, the European Union, these powers in Europe have to step up with more aid, getting more aggressive with getting that aid in there. We have to be aggressive with getting that aid, those Stinger missiles, those Javelins in there. Those are very effective against Russian fighters. Um, this is, these, these are questions that we've been asking the, the Secretary of Defense. They say at least 800 were, were delivered over the weekend. These will be very devastating to Russia, but we need to continue to push that. They're gonna, are they going to do a carpet bomb Berlin style, 1948? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't put anything past Putin right now. Right. Um, but it, I, I do fear that as he begins to lose, he will engage in this scorched earth campaign. It is, it is, it is harder than he thought, which is, again, why I say the, the, the European Union has to step up for their neighbor. They have to step up for their neighbor because they can they can reverse this with enough with enough aid if it's getting to the right place at the right time. It just takes time, and that's something the people of Ukraine just don't have as they are circling the cities. Um, Congressman, I, are, are you going to the State of the Union tonight? Well, <laughs> I don't have time to get tested. They want everybody to get tested, right. so I'm going to try. Okay, because. <laughs> Because now the news is you don't need to wear the mask, uh, which is which is progress. Uh, apparently, the United, you know, the the president's speechwriters had to throw out the uh, speech they had done a week ago because world events have changed it. And apparently, he will talk about the Russia. I just want to interrupt this uh, <laughs> this clip to say you don't have enough time to get tested. You can't send out an intern to CVS to grab a little test kit to get tested. Makes no sense. I had high hopes for Crenshaw. He's a war hero, Navy SEAL, seemed like a great guy, but I just don't know if he, I uh, I don't know, folks. I had high hopes for Crenshaw. I got to be honest. I still like him. I think he's a pretty decent guy. I just disagree on a lot of his policies. Anyway, I digress back to the clip invasion and how uh, the United States was able to rally the world. Apparently he's going to talk about inflation. He's going to talk about, you know, the cost to, to uh, Americans. And once again, he's going to push build back better. And he's going to say, you know, I know that Americans are hurting, but you pass build back better and prices are actually going to go down. So he's going to press you guys in Congress to do more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, Zelensky rallied the world, not Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden's feckless leadership possibly led up to this. Um, the world has allowed Russia to to capture an increasingly larger share of the energy markets and therefore become dependent on Russia and uh, embolden them to do this right now. Now, <coughs> Mistakes were made in the past. The question is, what can you do in the future? And Biden will refuse tonight to even acknowledge the fact that American energy dominance would prevent this kind of thing in the future. Because, look, there's two things that prevent war. Credible threat of force and leverage. And when it comes to leverage uh, with Russia, we're talking about energy markets. And America needs to, producing, needs to be producing more oil and gas, uh, more nuclear, and, and more oil and gas that Europe needs so that they don't have to rely on Russia and Russia can't you know, um, hold everybody hostage in situations like this. So I know Zelensky's wanting to join the EU. He wants to be admitted. They're saying it takes time. We can't do it quickly. He addressed the European Parliament earlier this morning. We had it live. But if you weren't watching, let me show uh, you and the audience a clip. We are showing everybody the European Union is going to be much stronger with us. So that's for sure. We have proven our strengths. We are exactly the, the same. Do prove that you are with us. Life will win over death and light will win over darkness. Glory be to Ukraine. And then he said, do not let us go. He stood up, you know, raised his arm, and then everyone in the audience gave him a standing ovation. Do you know the process of the EU? Could they just allow Ukraine to be a part of that quickly? Uh, short answer, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not, not, not an expert in this field, and I'm not sure what the process is. Well, like I said before, I'm, I'm happy to see the EU um, standing up to this. I mean, we're pre previously neutral countries looking to stand up to this. It looks like Putin's calculations were totally wrong, that we may increase NATO membership. Looks like they're going to possibly increase EU membership, which is exactly the opposite of what Putin wanted. Uh, and again, jo Joe Biden has to stand up to this. Instead of saying that, oh, well, this is a lesson where we need to move to, to cleaner, more Ugh. cleaner energy, solar, mm -hmm. And when, okay, look, here's a very clear message for Joe Biden. 
Okay, climate change is not killing scores of Ukrainians. The Russians are. Mm -hmm. And the way you stop the Russians is you remove their leverage. Yeah. It really is that simple. So when Alaska says we can produce more oil, let them produce more oil. When we have multiple export facilities that could be permitted to, to produce more LNG exports right now, allow those six permits to go through the DOE. I mean, there are very simple things that we can start to do right now. Uh, stop this moratorium on lease sales, for instance. I mean, it's, there, there's plenty of things that we can do that was, so that within the next few months to a year, we can start to overtake that market share from Russia and remove their leverage. We should have done it years ago, but we are where we are right now. And at least, at least you could acknowledge the problem. Hey, Congressman, we have re imported more gasoline than, uh, and refined petroleum products than any other nation in the world from Russia. We're going way over in 2021 where we were in 2020. So if you want to impact Russia, immediately change that policy, and you can announce that tonight. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I just laid out a couple steps that would be very simple. I mean, the one I forgot was the Keystone Pipeline, of course. Sure. You know, approve the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. it, that, that thing would have brought in 830,000 barrels a day. We import around average of almost 600,000 from Russia. So, so that import from Canada would be more. And Canada, by the way, has just announced that they will stop imports from Russia. Mm -hmm. So, look, we have to be able to do the same thing and make that case to the American people. Uh, this is war. They, the Russians have started a war, right? We're not talking about, oh, escalation. We're not talking about whether they will or they won't or whether they'll invade Kiev. They have. They've done right. it. And the world is rallying behind Zelensky. Right. And, right. And, 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 and instead of leading, Biden is sort of just maybe following, maybe tiptoeing around it. And, and to your earlier point, if we did that, uh, that would give us leverage. But then again, it's politics and uh, the president's far left base would revolt because he can't do that. He did it the right way the first day. Uh, you're, you're from the state of Texas. Polls now open. First primary of the 2022 election cycle. What's your prediction on how this is going to go? Well, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm actually curious about how Democrats will go. I mean, you saw AOC trying to unseat people like Henry Cuellar, like Lloyd Doggett. I mean, there's that war in the Democrat Party is also pretty interesting. Um, on our side, look, I'm really focused on on races like Wesley Hunt's, um, Morgan Luttrell. Uh, these are these are both races that are occurring right in the Houston area, right next to me. And uh, I'm re I think everybody should go out and vote for Morgan Luttrell and Wesley Hunt. Let's get them past this without a runoff. They are going to be great members of Congress. Right. And uh, then we'll move on to the general, where I where I think we can flip at least one seat. Uh, Monica De La Cruz is in somebody Texas. you should have on your radar in Texas, in South Texas. And uh, that, that's that's another great candidate. So I think, look, the Texas delegation is going to be All right. All right. Uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, uh, always great to talk to you. All right. So at the end of that clip, he was talking about Morgan Luttrell. Morgan Luttrell is the brother of the lone survivor, Marcus Luttrell. So do I hope he's elected? Yeah, I kind of do. I mean, I heard a story. I'll just give you a little story real quick. I read Lone Survivor and I read a, a bunch of war books, right? I like reading. Reading's fun. But anyway, I heard a story that when Marcus Luttrell was going through SEAL training at some point, right? Oh, I read it in the David Goggins book. David Goggins is another former SEAL. You can check him out on uh, Instagram. He is a motivator. He's got some foul language, but he is a motivator. His book is motivating as shit. All right. <laughs> it's a good book. Anyway, in this book. It's called Can't Hurt Me. It's David Goggins. It's a great book. I, I recommend it to anyone who is interested in Navy SEAL stuff and motivation and things like that. Anyway, he, he, he talked about how when Marcus Luttrell, and I think you guys have well, maybe have watched the movie The Lone Survivor, you know Marcus Luttrell. Wow, we're going off on a tangent. That's okay. Anyway, it's what I do, folks. This is Truman's Town Hall. I told you I should call it Tangent Town Hall. Marcus Luttrell needed to make a run, and he had his brother Morgan do the run for him. So they're twins, folks. They're identical male twins, and his brother came in and did the run for him because apparently Marcus Luttrell was not a very good runner, but Morgan was. 
and they were both Navy SEALs. Badass dudes, man. So, you know, and and I like Representative Crenshaw. I like him. He's the guy with the eye patch, and he he was he Pete Davidson on Saturday Night Live busting him up a little bit, and then he came on Saturday Night Live because it was no big deal. It's like I mean, folks in the military, we get our balls busted all the time. It's just part of being in the military. So it was no big deal to him. So that was major respect for him there. But some of his policies, man, I just, I question it. I'm like, are you really a Republican dog? Come on now. Think about that before you talk about it. But anyway, that was Fox and Friends with Dan Crenshaw. And they're talking about, uh, you know, arming the Ukrainians and getting involved. The Russians know we armed the Mahuja, the, the Mahujadeen. Anyway. Mahujadeen, and uh, we gave them Stinger missiles and then, you know, kept Afghanistan, you know, the Muslims in the fight, and they pushed back Russia. Listen, folks, here's the deal. There's no way Russia, if Russia and America went head-to-head without nukes, we'd crush them like a bug. We're just too powerful for them. But they have nukes, and they can launch them. They got that secret weapon. If we took out their nukes and just went head to head, son, I'm telling you right now, we would crush them like a bug. Oh, well. All right. So we're running long. We're running along. I know you folks have been watching and listening and paying attention to Ukraine and Russia. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to continue to update things as things get uh, more heavy. I'm going to look through some Twitter stuff real quick and I'll read you some some updates. And then we're going to get into my hometown, Huber Heights. I'm going to play a quick clip of that and then we'll end the podcast. But let's get into Twitter real quick and and see what's happening over there. All right. So the first thing I'm seeing is, and I encourage you guys to get a Twitter account. I have one over there. I don't, I've had several accounts and this one has zero followers. I, I had one that had a heck of a lot more followers than that. But I had to recreate one because uh, I left Twitter for a while. But anyway, Ellen News, E-L-I-N-T News, breaking. Over one million have fled Ukraine since last week. So that's that's one. Here's one of the checkmarked folks. It says it's Manalo de las something. Let me go to it. De los Santos. Best part of being a NATO member is that you can invade countries, commit war crimes, and never get sanctioned. So there's, wow, there's different different opinions. Dagan McDowell, yeah, I think we've heard her over on uh, Fox News. Oil surges to highest price in nearly 11 years, tops topping $111 per barrel. Yeah, folks, oil's going oil to go crazy. We're going to feel all of this, everything that's happened around the world, we're going to feel it. You're going to feel it in your pocketbook. You're going to be working more hours. You're going to be trying to, you know, figure all this stuff out too, folks. This this is a, a world crisis. How it ends, I don't know. Nuclear weapons, probably. Hopefully not, but doggone it. It's leading that way. Paul Nyland. Uh, says, instead of being numb to this after just seven days, can we just start raising outrage over the fact that Russia is sending God, I'm not going to say that word, I'm not going to use the GD, blank, GD attack, helicopters over Kiev, please. This isn't just a thing that's happening. Details to be noted. This is an unprecedented assault on a democracy. Folks, Ukraine's not really a democracy. It really isn't. Zelensky has jailed his uh, uh, his rivals. He's, I mean, he's, come on. I know he looks good right now, and he looks like a tough guy. Hey, a lot of dudes are tough guys. If the fit hit the chain here, I'm going to stand up. I'll probably send my family out like a lot of these folks, but I'll, I'd stand up. I don't care who's tacking in America. 
we going to roll. I'm ready to roll. You know what I'm saying? Right? I didn't stockpile this much ammo. Never mind. I don't have ammo. I have no ammo. I have no food. I have nothing. Hello? Let's see here. Dave Wasserman. I'm reading some blue checks here, folks. After last night, Republicans likely have a full state of Latinas contesting three Rio Grande Valley seats. I don't know what the heck that means. And then uh, I'm following some other folks. They're writing in Ukrainian. So I can't can't see what that's all about. Report air raids in most of Ukraine cities. Yeah. So anyway, I've been getting quite quite a bit of good information. Uh, there's uh, foreign fighters. Uh, Ukraine has opened up their military, much like France's foreign legion. They've created a, a legion of their own in Ukraine. There's Americans going over there. I actually saw a video of this fat guy, this uh, this old fat guy. He had gray hair, and he was standing by a Russian tank, and he was like, "The Russians are gonna kick their butt!" Woo! I, it was it was odd, very odd. So there it is, folks. My goodness, we're we're in certain tough times coming ahead. Be prepared. All right, you know. Be prepared for nuclear fallout. I mean, better to be prepared not need it than need it not have it, right? You know, that's the worst case scenario, but it's okay to be prepared for that. But also be prepared uh, prepared for um, anything to happen. We're living in strange times. Did you think 9-11 would happen? Did you think COVID-19 would happen and they would, hey, guys, two weeks to slow the spread. Just let's pause. No. <laughs> Two years later. Wow. All right. So we're done with that. I'm going to stop talking about that. Hometown, Huber Heights. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I tried to tune in to uh, what was going on in Huber Heights because there's an annexation thing going on, right? There's about... So b- before the Huber Heights City Council meeting, Bethel Township out of Miami County, posted this on Facebook. It says, on Monday night at the Huber Heights City Council meeting, the resolution to adopt a statement indicating the services the city will provide to the territory proposed to be annexed did not pass because one city council member walked out and did not vote. Thus, they could not reach the minimum five required votes. This is good news. However, According to the township's annexation lawyer, they still have another 21 days to pass a resolution. Two township trustees attended the meeting, as well as one Bethel resident. A trustee, Van Heeren, stated in the meeting, Bethel township residents shop in Huber stores, eat in Huber restaurants, go to the Huber Y, but do not wish to be Huber Heights. Please do not approve this resolution. So that's what they wrote over in Bethel Township. What, one walked out? One person? You know who did that? Richard Shaw, Ward 1 representative in the city of Huber Heights. He walked out, walked out of the meeting. How, why would he do that? No one on Team Heights would ever do that. Oh, but they have before. Yes, many years ago, there was a councilwoman who walked out on a vote from Team Heights. This is the games that they play. I mean, when you play those games, those games are going to come back at you. Instead of just, I don't know, playing it straight, doing what's right, and uh, conducting the city's business as the residents want you to conduct their business, you are a representative. Hello? Anyway. I'm going to play you this clip from the meeting, and then we'll come back with a little analysis. And remember, folks, there was no video. This is an audio clip only, and this was recorded live from the Huber Heights City Council Chambers. As the 21st century began, human evolution was at a turning point. Natural selection 
the process by which the strongest, the smartest, the fastest reproduced in greater numbers than the rest, a process which had once favored the noblest traits of man, now began to favor different traits. America! Most science fiction of the day predicted a future that was more civilized and more intelligent. But as time went on, things seemed to be heading in the opposite direction, a dumbing down. Every time a hurricane or storm's coming, the gas stations just fill up with women with plastic bags they get inside, and then they put the gas in, and then wonder why the gas eats through it and spills, and they just don't know. Now look at this woman, spraying gasoline on top of the car. This is not a joke. She thinks that's how you clean your car, and she's got her mask on. So let me get this straight. She's black. She's Indian. He's a reverend. He's a hero. And this guy is a woman? I'm gonna grow a magnificent pair of breasts. So that means that this is a peaceful protest. And this is a deadly insurrection. This guy's a white supremacist. And this guy won the election. The economy was in a state of deep neglect. A great dust bowl had ravaged food supplies. And the number one movie in the country was called Ass. And that's the Secretary of Health. It's kind of stupid. Today could be your lucky day. California's first vaccine lottery drawing takes place tonight. That's right. You can win one million dollars. Get vaccinated. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You're saying I can get this? Some delicious fries? But there's also a a burger element to this joints for jabs that's what they're calling it free joints today to those who could prove they got the covid vaccine do something smart yeah. the answer is mass formation psychosis did you just make that up huh? <laughs> i don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin frogs gay what a stupid son of a bitch if mars die in the world you're pretty dumb sometimes i'm kind of retarded <laughs> Man, that wasn't it. I'm sorry. I, I thought I was playing uh, a clip from Huber Heights City Council. I mean, it, it sounded like a, a clip from Huber Heights City Council, but this was the real clip where Representative Shaw left and Mayor Gore went on a tangent about being sued we're getting sued you're getting sued he was like oprah with that tangent he was like we're getting sued you're getting sued the whole place is getting sued they donated a bunch of money to me and i can't get this done what do you think's gonna happen all right i'm (laughs) i'm gonna play the clip this is from the this is the real clip from the Huber Heights City Council meeting. For this time, we're going to take a 10-minute recess to see if we can find Mr. Shaw. I mean, I don't think it takes this long to smoke a cigarette or go to the bathroom. He's missing in action. So we will, we will find out. We're going to take a 10-minute recess. Hey, folks. W- what if he had to poop? What if he had to poop? That takes a... Sometimes it takes longer than 10 minutes to poop. All right? But Mayor Gore wanted to get the cigarette dig in. Look, Mr. Shaw smokes cigarettes. A lot of us smoke cigarettes. Good night. We're from the 90s. And maybe he was pooping and then had to smoke a cigarette. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll play it again. For this time, we're going to take a 10 minute recess to see if we can find Mr. Shaw. I mean, I don't think it takes this long to smoke a cigarette or go to the bathroom. He's missing in action. So we will, we will find out. We're going to take a 10 minute recess. Okay. I certainly apologize for uh, the extension of that recess. Um,. So this council has had legally a statutory obligation to have a vote on this matter. And it is certainly my belief that Mr. Shaw uh, exited tonight's meeting in order to prevent me from voting. So we have um, a duly elected official who is playing games. And I'm enough. It's obvious what's happened tonight. Yeah, enough. This is he, out of order. No, it isn't. He didn't like what was happening. And You're he, not getting your and way. And he left. You're all upset, too. No, we're going to call oh, you. Your phone is 
We're going to call Hogan. Okay. We're, we're having the, no need for all this. So what I expect to happen, I fully expect that um, we'll call a vote. Looks like this will probably fail this evening, and I fully expect um, the landowners to file a, a court claim through an injunction and a writ of mandamus, and I expect the city to get sued because um, Mr. Shaw is neglecting his legislative duty. So with that said, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Rogers, call the roll. Mrs. Kitchen. No. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Shaw is absent. Ms. Baker. Yes. Mr. Campbell. Yes. Mrs. Burge. Yes. Mr. Otto. No. Mr. Lyons. No. And motion fails. Was it four to three? Okay. okay. Next up, Mayor. Yes. Um, I would uh, hope that this would come back to the city council work session in the next meeting. Uh, actually, I should have said that this will. Um, well, no, actually, it failed. Yes, I understand. So yeah, it, it won't be. It won't be back. So well, I, I expect the next action will be court action. Okay. Well. Like I said, I, I don't. We have 20 days. We have two weeks. It could be voted on. It's yet. dead. I think it. Excuse it's me. Failed. I, I I voted no. I understand that. I'm just pointing out. I'd like to see this come back on the next work session. That's one council member. If I get two more, we can have that again and discuss it in the next work session. Thank you. Doesn't the uh, petitioner have to resubmit it in order for it to be come back to uh, come back to the council again? If we just basically killed it, that's the way it's worked in the past. As far as I'm concerned, the, the issue's dead. It was voted down. Yeah. We can't just put it on another agenda after it's failed. Yes, Mr. Campbell. I'd like to entertain uh, Mr. Lyons' uh, thought. Ed, you're hoping this comes back in the future. Yeah, I think Mr. Shaw made a reasonable request. I had reasons, my reasons, for voting no tonight. Um, you know, I, I, Mayor, I do apologize for not being at the last work session, not being a little bit um, more well prepared with the information that was shared at the work session. I was uh, prepared and read through the packet tonight, so I'm pretty confident with my vote tonight. But I would like to uh, discuss this and entertain that in the next work session. And would you mind sharing what items you hope we discuss as far as this particular yes well we have 20 days and I would have liked to have uh, had another work session to discuss this and then uh, for a potential vote in two weeks okay thanks thank you <laughs> okay next up is uh, 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 oh yes Mr. Webb thank you Mayor. Uh, Mr. Lyons refers to 20 days am I not getting this? Uh, it, this was just voted down. There is no 20 days. The council has just voted uh, the extension of services agreement down. This now goes to back to the developer as a no vote from this council. Should the developer choose, I'm sure uh, it's just going to be a matter for the courts. This council won't have anything further to do with this, will we? Am I wrong? That's my, that's my understanding. I'll ask legal counsel. This counsel will have no further action on this. We voted it down tonight. I believe that is correct. Okay. So I think any discussion on this matter is a moot point. It's been voted down. Yes. It's now in the hands of legal. My understanding. My, that, that is my understanding as well. Thank you. I'm sure we will see them in court. Next up is item 12E. Item 12 All right, ladies and gentlemen of Huber Heights. So here's my thoughts on this. And before I begin those thoughts, I have not spoken to Mr. Shaw, Mr. Otto, Mr. Gore, or anyone else associated with the Huber Heights City Council. So I'm giving these thoughts fresh to you, the podcast listener. That's what I intend to do. Will I contact some of these folks and say, hey, what's your thought on this? Perhaps. Maybe I will. The one thing that 
stood out to me is when it was all said and done, Mr. Shaw had bounced, right? He left. He played the same game Team Heights played. Team Heber, Team Heights. We got that faction, right? Everybody understands there's a two-party faction, right? You got your Democrats and then your Republicans and Libertarians. Matt, but the mayor's a, a registered Republican or claims to be a rep- No, no, no. He always sides with the Democrats. Anyway, and, and, and you know what? Scratch that. Remove the, the Democrat-Republican label. You have two factions in the city of Huber Heights. Team Huber, which was originated, and I have dubbed the other side Team Heights. Right? There is a division on city council, and you can tell by all the frustration that goes in and out. And it's not needed. You're a city of what? It's now what? 42,000? Let's just say 50,000 people, right? And about 4,000 of them pay attention to what's going on. Anywho, that's another story. But the one thing that really stood out to me is when Mr. Lyons piped up and said, hey, let's revisit this. I know what I voted. I voted no tonight. But let's revisit this because we have 20 days. And Mr. Campbell, he reiterated that. Mr. Campbell, in my view, is the smartest politician on that council. I'm not saying the smartest person. I'm saying the smartest, the most cunning politician on that city council. On this podcast, I don't talk a lot about Mr. Campbell. I've interviewed him once. He was a very nice dude on the phone with me. Um, His son joined the Marine Corps. I wished him well. It was all that. Look, I know all that in and out politics, and I know the way he votes. He may do stuff on the background. I don't see it. I don't think Mr. Campbell's a bad dude. He's a politician. Look, politicians are going to do what they do. They're going to be political. They're going to try to win their side. Just as Team Huber wants to win their arguments, Team Heights wants to win theirs. And that's what it's all about. What we don't need, Mr. Campbell's very um, subdued. He may be working things in the background, which I think he is. You know, that's my opinion. I think he's working a lot of political things. Just as I thought Seth Morgan, former council member, twice over on the Hebride City Council, was working things in the background. Those guys were smart politicians. Right? I read Seth Mo- <laughs> Seth Morgan's book. Right? He wrote a book. He, he was looking to be Mr. Political. Oh, I'm going to be out there. Didn't work out for him too well. Anyway. Mr. Campbell's a very smart politician. Okay. There's some other politicians like Mayor Gore who are very emotional, who can't control their emotions. Those folks, they're not good politicians. They may win elections. Great. But when somebody better comes along, they're going to lose. And then they're just going to be a dust in the wind. It's going to happen. Trust me, folks. And I'm not saying nothing bad. I just think if you're going to run for for city council in the city of Uber Heights, take notes from Mr. Campbell. Whether I, I, I probably don't agree with him on a lot of issues, and I know I haven't, but I think he's a smart, cunning politician. Take notes. And Team Huber, I believe, took notes. Because I don't know how the backroom deals happen over in Team Heights. We know it happens because if you've paid attention long enough, you've seen how people, oh, I get up and speak. Oh, and oh, all of a sudden there's a recall. uh, Folks, I've been paying attention way too long to understand, to not understand what happens in the city of Hebrew Heights. It's weird. 40, 50,000 people and and you have to garner that much power? power over like what what housing development make your buddies rich what's in it for you 
right? Are you making, you know, when I ran, I just wanted traffic to run smooth, right? Police and fire to work smooth. Infrastructure to be built up. City of your pride said, <laughs> you suck, Matt. You're a horrible politician. <laughs> you are last. Anyway, <laughs> there was that clip. Hey, all's Team Heber did right there with uh, Richard Shaw bouncing was they they pulled a card from Team Heights playbook or they pulled a page. Let's say that they pulled a page from Team Heights playbook. Don't forget that this has been done before. There's been <laughs> politicians that have stepped away from the dais before. It's happened. And this, I think, that I can recall, this is the first time Team Hubert did that. But they're just, you know, as we know, Glenn Otto and Richard Shaw, they're lame duck politicians. They said they're not running again for Ward 1 and at large. Some suggest they're going to run for something else. I I don't know. I think they're going to go into private life. And, you know, folks, there's, there's a lot more they can do if they really care about Huber. You know, there's a lot more they can do on the outside. Folks have to pay attention, but I did this podcast for a long time, a long doggone time trying to get folks interested and trying to inform folks, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. These are the tricks they're trying to play. If you folks think for one minute that one side's playing tricks and the other side isn't, oh my goodness, I have some oceanfront property in Arizona to sell you. Let me tell you. They're both playing games, right? One plays a game the other has to counter and then they get in this tit for tat deal <sighs> i don't know what what would fix it let's think solution oriented one side could stop playing games but then they lose leverage right say team huber stopped playing games and didn't leave and they were voted and then mayor gore got to vote well then they get their way because Mayor Gore was given money for his campaign by developers and contractors and the like, right? Was he going to vote no? Absolutely not. That's why he was so angry, because he wanted to vote yes. He wanted to break the tie. Only two times has he broken a tie that I've been paying attention, right? One was the medical marijuana. He banned that. The other was for keeping the former, former city manager. Right? Those were the two things that he, I mean, his tie-breaking has not been very popular. Yet he continues to get elected because the city of Uber Heights has about 4,000 people paying attention or willing to vote. Either way, maybe, four, maybe half of the 4,000 are paying attention. You know, I look at the other pages. So we run Brick City Town Hall. That's where a lot of the politics gets talked about. It's what it was designed for. But you look at some of the other pages and it's just, hey, I went through the drive through today. And boy, that service was horrible. Or is Wendy's open today? Or, wow, what's going on over on Dial Road? There's a lot of cops over there. It's just a bunch of... <laughs> nosy nelly stuff it's not stuff that has substance or importance like what just went down at city council this week anyway there it is folks i could drone on for hours about this stuff i really could true podcast at gmail.com if you want to come on the podcast and talk about this stuff i'll put you on i don't care we'll talk about it all I don't care at all. I'm not afraid to be sued. Psh, whatever. Holler at your boy. But, uh, yeah, come on. Come on the podcast. If not, oh, well, we'll continue to talk about Ukraine. We'll talk about World War Three, the possibility of. Hey, 
none of this may even matter <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. I'll try to do better next time. Talk to you later. Why you causing division? I loved your music, now you're homophobic, all for attention. They say I'm only popular because I'm controversial. But is it that your favorite rappers all with pop commercial? Y'all got Spotify to ban my songs, I guess my topics hurt you. And do y'all miss real hip hop because this the time reversal? Your baby can promote violence and drugs all on his CD. But he'll get canceled if he ever repents LGBT. I know everybody hates me, but I also know they need me. But they cancel me because I don't succumb, my freedoms freely. And hip hop wasn't all. Now rappers wear dresses and calling each other sweetie. Well, somebody gotta say it, huh? Why can't it be me? Can I say screw Dr. Fauci? Can I say screw the CDC? Hey, uh-oh, Bryson, tone it down. You know we need your voice. God of the world. Well, that's an easy choice. Who has time for some white guy to be a limb face mask? Playing my music, screaming everything that I say is bad. I can't bow down to the mob cause I'm too real. I can't be control cause I don't need a deal. They say you going way too far, you need to chill. Sorry, I don't really care about how you feel. Ay, I can't bat out to the mothers, I'm too real.